Hello viewers and welcome to another episode of Space Science with Python. In our last videos we had a focus on the whole comet population, so we checked and analyzed the distribution of the eccentricity, we um, yeah, had an analysis of the p-type comet, the c-type comet, we checked the tisserand parameter and so on, and I think all in all we have a good understanding of the dynamics of all the comets that are out there. Today I would like to focus more on one particular comet, and this comet is churyumov gerasimenko You may know the comet. It uh, was visited a few years ago by the European Space Agency spacecraft Rosetta. And Rosetta had also a small lander on board called, Fie, called Fiele, which was then deployed and then it hopped around until it landed in some dark cavity running out of energy. And yeah, that was basically it for the lander. Here you see one of the images from Rosetta. You see the comet core. Um, it was yeah, or it was like a two-body or binary object probably. So it appears that that the, there is a larger sphere here and a, a larger sphere here and a smaller one here being connected. And you see also here some activity due to the um, yeah, close distance between the comet and the sun. So you see some outgassing, gases, uh, dust and so on being um, ejected into space. Now this picture here from Astronomy Picture of the Day, and there are a lot of pictures here summarized. So I will provide the link in the description so you can click around and see some images here. For example, some close images of some cliffs and so on on the comet. So this looks really, really amazing. This is from the Osiris camera on board of Rosetta. We have also yeah, some nice shots from the jets. Yeah, some animated GIFs, for example. See the comet rotating and so on, and the jet also pretty nice. Yeah, and also some, some images from far, far away where you see here also the jets, um, yeah, more enhanced, let's say. Now, all in all, we got a lot of pictures from from Churyum of Gerasimenko. So not only from the um, scientific instrument OSIRIS, but also from the navigation camera NAVCAM. So a lot of images, a lot of data you can use to analyze the comet. Like for example, check the topography of the comet, check the, checking the activities, and so on and so forth. And one of the analyses was later being provided and uploaded into the NAF kernel repository. You may re recall the kernels from SPICE. And one of the kernels is the so-called DSK kernel. And the DSK kernel is, the, is, a, is a directory or a kernel type that stores the shape model of objects. So we have an actual shape models from the Rosetta mission, from some asteroids that have been visited, but also from the comet Churyum of Gerasimenko that are stored here. So you will see a lot of different objects, some PNG, BDS file, whatsoever, OBJ. Um, so a lot of different images uh, or, or models that are being stored here in this repository. Now, today I would like to download two of these images, uh, images uh, shape models, and show you how you can create a 3D model, how you can render the model, how you can interact with it, and we will use it also later for some scientific work. Not today, but today is only yeah, showing you how to read in this um, shape model file. But before we start, you may see that VS Code has been turned off. Um, today we need something called, which is called Qt. Um, so we need also some, some, some toolkits and so on to create um, some kind of uh, application. And it's a little bit, uh, yeah, it was a little bit difficult for me to get an application running inside a Docker container, and especially not inside a Docker container, but in remote containers on VS Code. So I was not able to run it. So we have today to work on with the classical Jupyter Notebook you see here. Um, so, if you are not familiar with how to run this uh, from the from the terminal, at the end of this of today's video, I will show you how to um, yeah run Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab server 
um, from your terminal, so outside of VS Code. And please also note that the requirements TXT has been as well updated for this, we are called it rendering or GUI part. The first thing is PyQt5, okay? And the second thing is VisVis. And VisVis is this, is this nice, small library. I totally like that. Um, I think it's also already f several years old. I started using it in my bachelor thesis. Um, I found it, I don't know how and when. I think it was part of, even or started with Python 2.7 or so. And I always like that. It's, it has some nice rendering capabilities for 3D stuff. Um, it does not have a lot of recognition here on GitHub, 190 stars around. Um, okay, I'm not signed in, but yeah, I started as well. And I really like that, that library uh, from uh, Alma Klein. And yeah, I will provide the link also into the description of the YouTube video. Uh, check this out. It's really amazing. Um, yeah, you see here some, some teapot uh, in 3D. But we will see how we can use VisVis and its capabilities to visualize Churyumov Gerasimenko. Now let's go to the coding part. Um, I already start create, started creating two uh, cells. The first one is importing some libraries we will need today. Um, we have again also image IO and so on. So image IO from last time we used it to create some um, to create uh, yeah, some animations or not animations. Yeah, some gif anima uh, some gif animated gifs. We will also use it today. We use our auxiliary functions to download something. And here in the second cell, we have some download path. So path where we download everything. We want to extract two comet models. Um, so in this huge repository, there are two um, models. One is, let's call it, in a, in a low resolution. One is in a higher resolution. And uh, so depending on your performance on your computer, use the low one or the high one. Here we will use the high one and then the download URL, um, which is just uh, yeah, the URL from the repository. And then here you see the dictionary is called, um, depending whether we want the high or the low resolution file. And then if the file is not existing, it will be downloaded. And um, yeah, I just downloaded it. And now uh, I would say we can read the shape file. So we have no idea how it looks like, of course. But um, yeah, maybe we can use um, pandas uh, to, to read it. And I would say, uh, let's start some coding. So we will call it shape object, yeah, comet 67p shape object. And then we will use read CSV, it's a very simple CSV file. And it was stored in kernels, um, DSK. And then, yeah, we will use the this argument here, the dictionary, the file name, the, the high resolution part. And I've, of course, I know how the file looks like. So it looks a little bit like black magic, but I know it already. The delimiter is a white space. And the names of the columns are um, type x1, x2. Ah, oh, come on. And x3. We will get to this in a moment to see what it means. So first, let's load the shape model and create a new cell. And then we can print some statistics. So let's have a look what this object file is all about. So first thing would be to see what is the shape. So yeah, we have around, what is it? six million rows in four columns. So that's quite huge, I would say. And we can also maybe print, yeah, maybe the first five rows or so. And there you see the first five rows. We see here the type, the x1, x2, x3. And how does the file look like in total? So the shape model ha contains two, has two types. The one type is the, is the so-called vertices word of vertices, which means it's like like basically a vector. So you have at some point a, a starting point, a source of origin, yeah, zero, zero, zero in three-dimensional space. And then you define a vector into this direction, minus 1.496 and so on. 
And then you define a second vector, third vector, fourth, fifth, and so on. So a lot of vectors just pointing in, in some directions. And the directions here, they are given already in our in some physical or in some 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 meaningful dimensionality. Here it's given in kilometers actually. So the resulting shape model is given in kilometers. So we have our yeah our shape model is also scaled correctly. Now there's a different type, not only the vertices, but also something called faces. And the faces are, you can imagine that three vectors are somehow creating, or if you connect them, you have something like a like a enclosed area, a triangle, and this triangle is called face. And these faces are defined by indices. So you see, um, you know which vertices define a face. And then you have a lot of triangle uh, tiles that are creating this shape model. So it's basically, yeah, just a, just a bunch of a lot of faces, a bunch of a lot of triangles just being sticked together to create the comet shape. Now let's have a look at this, I would say. Let's, let's put a lot of print commands here. Let's have a look how the type looks like. So what is the shape? How many entries do we have? So first of all, for the vertices, then we can create the shape. And we know it has four rows, so uh, four columns. So let's have a look. We have around two million, um, two million vertices. And faces is here F, four million, okay. So we can, some statistics about the number of vertices and faces and so on. Just, just play around a little bit to get a better understanding. So we get a better understanding of this. Now to use VisVis, um, now here VisVis has uh, a nice documentation in the, in the corresponding wiki page. Yeah, you don't have to, you can go through it a little bit. I already did it. And we can, First of all, we have to do some very, very minor, let's call it not data engineering, but some data preparation to, uh, to, to, to visualize our comet. So first of all, we need to assign um, to a list all our um, vertices. So we say the type shall be equal to V. And then we need not the type, but we need the x1, x2, and x3. So we need the values, and this needs to be converted to a list, to a list. And the same thing applies also for the faces, yeah, so we do the same thing here, but it doesn't need to be a list, I think. Faces, the type is F, and then we can assign it vertices and faces. Perfect. So let's have a look maybe at the faces. We can yeah, print the faces, to just have a look at them, print. Faces, maybe, I don't know, the first five ones. And there you see. These are the indices of the, uh, of the vertices that create a single face. Now the thing is, or important to know is that, uh, what is the minimum index? The minimum index in this file is one. And Python starts at zero, so we have to um, subtract our, um, our face indices by one, so faces equals faces minus one, and then we can convert it to a list afterwards. But first, yeah, I think it was floats, so we have to convert it to integers, and then we can say faces to list executed, and we are done. Just takes a moment. Now we can create our application. Um, I already prepared something also with PyQt5 to create a main window that can be sized depending on some resolution. Um, 
I just have it here in some temporary cache file. So yeah, you can go through the documentation, but I don't want to bore you here with the main window definition. Just let me execute it here. And this is something we will call in a moment. So when we are creating our application, we will also create a main window uh, that can be then used to resize the resolution. Otherwise, the resolution will also have some kind of, let's say, default value. Now, this, this, um is now important as VV, as you hear, as you see here in this line. And first of all, we create an application with VisVis. So we use VisVis use, and then we say app create. Now the next thing is that we want to have our window as well, and the window was defined above, where we also use uh, PyQt5, and then we can say main window resize, and then we can say I don't know resolution 1000 and then 700 or so yeah so you see when I execute it Python is doing something in the background uh, ah I have to make the app run of course oh I forgot it I have to run it yeah and now you see it it's basically empty so there's nothing in there because we didn't define anything Ah, and now it's also running here Cool. So what we can do now is we can uh, create our commit. So we call this uh, this mesh, and there and mesh actually expects what we already defined, namely the vertices and the faces. And then we say also vertices per face is equals three because maybe there are other definitions using four or five. And then we can run it. And we should get our comet. Yeah, there it is. And there you see the comet. Yeah, so this is pretty nice and fancy, but we see, yeah, let's let's do some 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 before we play around with this, let's let's do some changes. And I already already played around a lot with it. It's a little bit familiar. Maybe you get a little bit familiar um you you, you the commands you see are a little bit familiar for you if you already have some experience, for example, with matplotlib. So for example, you can get the axis and then you can say, okay, I want to have a different background color for the axis. Of course, the commands are here a little bit different. Space is black, so let's use the spaces. Let's also get rid of the grid because um, let's purely focus on, um, on the shape. And then also, making it invisible the grid turning off and the axis visible equals false as well and then we can also set, have to set a camera the camera here is um, 3d it's called 3d camera so we can interact with it nicely it's also very cool to to play around with the camera so you can for example set a field of view in degrees yeah you can make 120 degrees with some fish eye lens or some 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 tele lens with 10 degrees let's stick with 60 degrees for example and then you can also set some initial values for the elevation and for the azimuth so for example you can say okay i would like to have my initial camera at an azimuth of um, let's say 120 degrees and for the uh, elevation we use for example 25 degrees yeah just as a small example and then we can run it and yeah my mac mini is not always so fast take some time and there we are this is our shape model and now you will see that there are a lot of there's a lot of information in there my mac mini is a little bit slow um with the rendering so if you have a more powerful machine that's good oh you see it's a little bit oh it's laggy so i can maybe resize the main window a little bit now it's very small for a youtube video but it should be a little bit faster okay i'm also screen recording so this makes it probably even worse um, oh yeah, that's really bad. Jeez, that's not good. But you, but I think you get the idea, right? And I will also we will also create some kind of um, sort of animated GIF for this. So just in a moment, you can zoom in here. You see here the structures of the comet. You see here, um, it consists of two. Let's call it, call it spheres. The smaller one, the larger one. We have 
here some kind of boulders or rocks in there. He's also quite smooth, so it's probably covered with dust. We have some other areas that are more, yeah, reminding us of cliffs and so on. And if you zoom down under the comet, you see its the shape is not really well defined. And that's because during the Rosetta mission, the entire uh, lower side or the lower side of the comet was always uh, on the night side. And that was quite difficult to get a perfect image of this part. So this remains a mystery. And um, yeah, oh, this is not good to show in a YouTube video. This is so slow. But you get the spirit, I think, right? It looks pretty amazing, I would say. Yeah, so play around a little bit and see what you can do with it. Now, um, let me go already here. Um, now we can create an animation. <laughs> you maybe saw it, uh, I already created one. So in the same, same way as we did it for the Tisserand parameter, we will create a small, um, a small animation, let's say a camera that goes around the comet in uh, one degree steps for 360 degrees, so um, complete view around, and then we can also add a little bit of the of the of some some specifications of the of the lightings and so on to make it more realistic. So let's first create a smaller window, so it's a little bit maybe faster to create. We are um, also creating our mesh, same way as before. And then we can change the parameters of the shape object, which is, which is quite nice. So you can, for example, say that this peculiar value should be zero. So you saw it was quite shiny, like, like the comet was made out of, um, I don't know, silver or so. But it's not really realistic feeling, let's say. Of course, now it's getting more into direction of art and rendering. But um, yeah, let's, let's, let's change the shape a little bit. You can also make the um, reflection a little bit more diffuse and so on. So you can play around with a lot of stuff. Now the next thing is a little bit, yeah, uh, maybe appears a little bit like, like, like magic, but we have to create, uh, extract the figure. Then the figure net needs to be updated when we are rotating the, um, the camera angle, but you will see it in a moment. We also have, or well, we should, we can also define all uh, background color again of the axis. We should do this as well. Also turning off the uh, grid and the um, and the labels and so on. So turning off everything. Also let's stick with the same camera settings. 60 degrees appear, appears to be nice. And then we can also define some kind of zoom. So we can zoom out for our initial uh, uh, rendering. And then we can also play around with the light settings. Now, this again, this is a little bit like, yeah, what am I doing here? Just playing around. Yes, it's basically a little bit playing around when you do it the first time. And um, yeah, just do it. Ch change some settings and you will see how everything changes. Here we can, yeah, can turn off the, uh, the main light. So there's some default. And now we can create our own, our own light source um, that maybe should yeah, remind us of the uh, of the sun or so. So we turn on some light source, and then we can also set the position of the light source. I mean, I don't want to put it at one AU now or five AU. Yeah, just put it at five kilometers from X Y Z, and then we can create our for loop where we are creating or rendering our comet images. So what do we want to change? We want to change the azimuth angle of our camera. Let's use also TQDM to see how fast this goes. And the azimuth angle should go from 0 to 360 degrees or 359. So this is our for loop where we are creating our, um, our rendering. So with every step in the for loop, we are doing an up doing an update of the uh, of the azimuth angle of the camera so we just assign it a new value here and then we can draw the axis 
and then we need to also update the entire figure draw now and then we can um, extract maybe a temporary image of it so this is get frame so we get the frame from what we are displaying and put it into the temp image um, variable and then we can append it into our comet images uh, list that was defined here and that's also empty and there we append the temp image but uh, for our project I've played around we have to make it encoded in 8-bit later as type numpy unit u init 8 so in every for loop the camera updates the wall figure and axis update and are being redrawn and the result is being stored in some temporary um, variable that is then stored in this list in 8-bit decoded uh, way and then afterwards we can again use as last time image io and make the mim save to say okay comet churyumov gerasimenko should be stored as a gif and we take the comet images and the duration of a single image given in seconds should be 0.04 seconds for example so hopefully there's no mistake but let's run it and it doesn't run does it yes it does okay now this is very interesting because when i turn off my screen recording then uh, it takes around or let's say it creates around 20 images per second now it's five images per second so somehow my computer is a little bit um, overwhelmed by all the tasks but this gives me some time to to drink my coffee almost a little bit late for coffee but still so we are creating our images we are saving them afterwards so now the for loop is still the for loop that um, creates the images in the background they are actually being rendered but let's not spoil ourselves let's wait until this is finished five more seconds and we're done now i think this is now the last image you see here okay and here's our resulting gif i think it was now overwritten by the most uh yeah i created it today already an hour ago for testing purposes and i modified it just a moment ago yeah i just rewrote it recreated it and now i can use uh, for example here safari to visualize it and there you go there you see the creation of the gif okay there are some artifacts a little bit weird i think this maybe the safari is creating it or maybe due to the encoding no well, it's a little bit unfortunate but again just play around a little bit and see what you can do do i see yeah i see it here as well ah that's quite bad oh that's really bad that's really bad well it won't get any award for uh, 3d animations so so but hey you get a good understanding and and feeling how the comet looks like not only from images but really you have your own 3d model now your your scripts you can use other shape models from other asteroids or comets that we have i mean truly Trium of Gerasimenko is the most high resolution object we have. It's it's really amazing. Um, yeah, maybe you can play around to get rid of these stupid artifacts here. Um, when I wrote the script, I used it for the low resolution image, which has only, I think, only a fifth or so of the faces. Maybe it's because of this. I don't know. And now you may say, yeah, cool, rendering, 3D and so on. Is it even helpful from a scientific perspective? So let's get to the summary and let's see uh, what we can do and i don't want to uh, make some advertisement for a publication or work i was working on but i personally was working on the Fila lander mission 
on an instrument called the Dust Impact Monitor. So you see here a paper published on astronomy and astrophysics. Um, the paper is also available for free, so free assess. I will provide the link into the description. Yeah, you see here is also my name in there um, with the affiliations at this time. Oh, already seven years ago, so or this is six and a half years ago. This is amazing. And then we wrote a small paper about the landing procedure of Fila when it was being deployed. And our instrument was uh, responsible for measuring, measuring dust particles. Small spoiler, we measured, I think, if I recall it correctly, a single particle. So it was uh, yeah, not a big scientific output, but still quite interesting. And with the instrument we have, I'm not getting into detail today, um, we can, we could, we were able to um, compute or determine the um, material properties of this particle. So the, 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 yeah, not only the shape or so, but also some, some other elasticity uh, values and whatsoever. And I just opened the paper. The paper is here. And let's zoom out a little bit. So you can maybe go through it a little bit. There's a lot of uh, explanations about Rosetta and Fila, what the instrument is all about. The instrument was mounted here on the lander. So this is actually the lander. There is the instrument on top of it. Some explanations, the dust, imp the dust impact monitor. This was the name of the instrument. Some equations are also shown. Then our measurement values during the descent phase and so on, etc. And now... This image here that I created with a colleague together, and it appears a little bit familiar for you, maybe. Yeah, I actually used VisVis and Python and everything to create the shape model. I used uh, Spice and the kernels of the Fila lander to determine the trajectory of the of the uh, of the uh, of the lander to see where it was supposed to land. Uh, we also colored uh, the areas where our instrument was active, so here in gray. And then my colleague, um, he created a 3D model of the uh, Fide lander with the determined the corresponding uh, 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 yeah, pointing or alignment of the of Fide. You see the, 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 the legs are pointing towards the comet. Of course, this is not in scale. And... Um, yeah, he for the for the time where the particle impacted the instrument, we computed the pointing and also where was the sun, where did the particle come from, and so on. And then we put put everything into a paper. So what you just learned in this small Jupyter notebook is something you can use for actual scientific insights. So that's pretty amazing, and we will do this. I think. Yeah, maybe we can, at next time or at some other time, we will use the Fila kernels to compute the tra trajectory. And we can also see whether we find online somewhere the um, original data of this instrument. So uh, to show you that you have all the tools and the assess, yeah, because the data is available for free, to recreate this figure, for example, and this analysis we did. So you can... Download all the data and see. Okay, um, was it was it is it realistic what we did or not? And with the phases we have here, or vertices and phases of the comet, you were we were then also able to compute the distance to the Berry Center and to the surface. So the Berry Center lays maybe he around here. The surface is closer to the Fila. So this graph makes also sense. So the distance of of the lander versus the time. Um, when it was deployed and so on and um, yeah so yeah some analysis afterwards and yeah some equations if you're into this just go ahead yeah so you see even with the small um, script we created here we have a nice foundation to do some actual science um, that was even published in a in a nice uh, journal called astronomy and astrophysics so yeah I hope you will create this 3D models. I hope you enjoyed the, uh, today's video. And don't forget, after my final words here, I will add a small video afterwards to show you how to start the Jupyter lab from the terminal. Until next time. Okay, I'm back um, to show you how to start Jupyter Lab from the terminal. Um, maybe everybody of you has their have their uh, 
environment, the virtual environment, um, somewhere else probably. Uh, I just I would just recommend I think the second or the third video I created showing how to create virtual environments. Um, I will provide the link into the description. Um, but now let's assume you have a Python environment, you have a terminal, for example, on Mac or Linux for all Windows users. I'm sorry, I'm not, I I really don't know how to do it there. Um, yeah, I think there are, of course, also some tutorials. Now I'm in my Astronis uh, YouTube tutorial uh, library, uh, directory, not library, where we have here code num um, yeah, tutorial number 22, Comet in 3D. And first we need to start the, um, uh, we have to, 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 to start the environment, Python environment. So we doing source, going into the Python environment. Where was it? I think, I oh, know, a little bit back. So I have to go to directories back, Python environment, astronus, uh, bin sor uh, activate. So now it's activated. Oh, it actually was already activated. So what a pity, but it doesn't matter. And now you can simply start Jupyter minus lab. And then it starts. And there you go. Oh, it's now Firefox started, but yeah, should load. Yep, there it is in um, now in Firefox with my, my a lot of bookmarks bookmarks i save and never read you you know the feeling probably and there we have jupyter lab and then you can play around a little bit yeah again i recommend the other video i uploaded a few weeks ago